morning and welcome. This morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 39. If you have a copy of the Bible, I invite you to turn there with me. If you don't have a copy of Scripture, uh, there is a Bible underneath the chair in front of you. We're on page 467 uh, in the chair Bible. If you're new to Parkwood, let me give you a brief explanation of what's about to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share a, a sermon in what we call and what is called expository preaching. So that means last Sunday I was in Psalm 38. This week I picked up in Psalm 39. It's not always that we go from chapter to chapter, but we so, just so happen to be studying the Psalms that way. Now, what does expository preaching mean? It means this. The text is going to dictate the sermon. So, so I didn't get an idea this week of something I wanted to say to you and then go find a passage of Scripture to back it up. I went in the reverse. I studied Psalm 39 asking the question, what is God saying in this text to his people? So that's the attempt, is to bring to you today what Psalm 39 is saying to God's people. Now, you're probably not really familiar with Psalm 39. It's probably not on your favorite list. It's probably not one that you read very often. That's why we do expository preaching, so that we deal with these texts that sometimes we avoid or are unfamiliar with. And I tell you, God has dealt very strongly in my own heart with this text, and I trust he will deal with you as well. So let's stand acknowledging this is the word of God. Sorry about that. Psalm 39, to the choir master, to Dudethan, a psalm of David. I said, I will guard my ways, that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, O Lord, make me know my end. And what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath, Selah. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man for, with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath, Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would take your word, speak clearly into our hearts and our lives. Spirit of God, lead us now. Speak into every person gathered where you need to deal with them. I pray, God, that I would submit to you, that you would show favor among your people and Speak your word now. And God, that the outcome would be glorifying to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm sitting with those who are preparing to preach this week. The churches that launched from here and our campuses, we all preach the same text because we all use the same growth group material. And as we were discussing this, Pastor Casey, who'll be going to Mount Holly, is preaching right now uh, down at Seven Oaks uh, Church. I said, when was the first time you were aware of the brevity of life? And Casey spoke up and said, it was when I was a small child 
A tragic situation happened with my neighbors. And as I watched that unfold that day, it was the first time I became aware of how brief life is. Now, when he started telling this story, I clued in pretty fast. I was across the street. I was the pastor there with that family in that tragic situation. It was one of those stunning pastoral moments to where I became aware of the brevity of life. And here I sat staring at an adult man who just told me he was a small child. So in Casey's story, the brevity of life swept over me while I asked the question. Brothers and sisters, that's part of my prayer for you today. Part of my prayer for you is that you will consciously think about the brevity of life. Now, here's the main idea of the sermon. It's not just that. It's that the knowledge of the eternal Holy Lord gives perspective to temporary sinful people. So God desires an outcome for David, and he desires that outcome for us. There's similarities between Psalm 38. If you studied them both together, you'd begin to see it. There's a connection to being surrounded by the wicked, silence before the wicked. There's a clear connection to discipline, to confession of sin, to the sense of urgency. And then this desire to wait on the Lord or to hope in the Lord. So this is a song to be sung among God's people. It's to the choir master, to Jeduthun. He's one of the leaders of worship in Jerusalem. He's identified at other places in the Bible. This is a reflection psalm of something that has transpired in the past that is to be instructive for today. Now, it would be hard for me to come to you personally. Doesn't mean it's impossible. It'd just be harder if you were in the midst of a difficult situation that was a consequence of your sin, for me to sit down and instruct you in these principles today. That's why God has given his word, that we move through his word so that we are instructed so when those moments come, we can make sense of it. So we're answering the question, what do you do when you've sinned and you've experienced or experiencing discipline and find yourself in the midst of difficulty? How do you respond? First thing we see, David remains silent in the presence of the wicked concerning his difficulties. Verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways. So what ways does David need to guard or to watch? The answer is what he says. Because what we say can become expressions of sin very quickly. He says that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. So there's a very specific reason why he's being quiet. Because the wicked, the godless, the unbelieving are in his presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail. My distress grew worse. Now when I read this text, James immediately comes to my mind. James 1, 19, I'll just quote it. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Why? For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Whether you've ever knowingly experienced or acknowledged it, when you find your yourself in a place of discipline, you're tempted to get angry. You're tempted to say something like, why, why should I obey God if he's going to do something like this to me? How can I trust God? Does he really love me? How can a loving God discipline me? And if you're not careful, you go deeper into sin. David knows he's in danger of this. He says in verse 3, my heart became hot within me. As I mused, as I pondered and thought. Can I just take a sidebar for a second? The word amusement, amusement means not pondering. 
We're a society consumed with amusement. I, I amused the fire burned, then I spoke with my tongue. So this is welling up within him. Now, this is a quote. I have often wished that I could take back an angry word. Amen. I have often wished I could take back an angry word, but I have never wanted to take back a prayer to God for help. So it sounds like he's about to erupt in anger. That's not what he does. It's welled up within him, so what he does is go before the Lord. And here's what he does. He acknowledges that his life on earth is a mere breath before the Lord. So this experience of discipline has taught him something. So he's going to come and confess to the Lord what he has learned, what has become obvious to him. Oh, Lord, make me know my end, what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. So this has transpired in my years of pastoral ministry to where we have shifted that nobody wants to call it a funeral anymore. We want to now call it a celebration of life i am continually instructed i don't want this to be boring or sad or etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. all right let me just pastor you before you get there because i'm going to say this when you say that to me we grieve not as those who have no hope okay i get you we don't want a morose droning, overwhelmingly sad moment. I got you. We want to be hopeful people. We want to celebrate what God has done. But here's the other thing. We want to grieve. We want to come face to face with this reality. My loved one's gone. They're gone. And I just want to say to you, very briefly from a counseling perspective, burying grief is not good. God designed you to grieve. Grief is a healthy thing when it's done with hope. And I just want to help you parents for a moment. When I was standing at the graveside of Nikki Bailey a couple of weeks ago, something stunning happened to me that, that uh, I didn't even realize. There were children there. It's the first time in my conscious memory in a long time that I remember children being at a graveside. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. Your children need to learn this principle too. In a healthy, right way, death is a part of life. It's a part of the world you live in. And, and David's saying to the Lord, Help me know this. He says, behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. If you've ever been around horses, you measure horses in hands. That horse is so many hands tall. Well, it's the way you do it. You turn your hand to the side. This is the measurement. This is a hand breadth. You stack them up. So this was the, the level, level of measurement. You didn't have tapes that you ran out. You measured in hand breaths. So how long is your life? A few. I don't know what, how many that is exactly, but not a lot. A few hand breaths. My lifetime is as nothing before you. That does not mean, I have this written in the margin of my Bible, so if I ever read this, I remind myself, that does not mean my life is insignificant. It does not mean your life is insignificant. It means your life is not eternal. God is eternal. And compared to an eternal holy God, our few handbreadths are nothing. They're immeasurable. They're small. They're minuscule. Surely all mankind stand as a mere breath. Selah. Now your mind's my mind goes immediately to James 4.14. You do not know that tomorrow will bring what is your life, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So it's a cold morning. You breathe out, and the 
steam comes out of your mouth for a few seconds and gone. So compared to eternal holy God, that's what our life is, just a breath. Now, I want to credit this. I recently had a class with Dr. Jim Hamilton. He's an Old Testament scholar. Um, and he pointed out in this text what I wouldn't have seen, even though I do try to study the language. Here's what it says in the Hebrew. Surely all Adam stands as a mere breath, Abel. So I'll say it in English. Surely all Adam stands as a mere breath, as a mere Abel. This is beautiful poetry. And that's what those words mean. Adam can be translated mankind and Abel translated breath. Now let's put it together with a story. Through Adam, sin entered the world. What's the consequence of sin? God told him it would be. You'll surely what? Die. And what happens to his son Abel? He lives a brief, short life that is cut down. We're all people who are going to draw our last breath. And for some, it's going to be shorter than others. I had to memorize this my senior year of high school. Macbeth's speech starts out tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day. I won't quote the whole thing. He says this, out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. Now, when I read the next verse, it certainly appears Shakespeare got some influence right here. Surely a man goes about as a what? A shadow. A shadow. The image of something. That's all we are. We're, the, we're not God. We're significant because we're in the image of God. It's the same word as shadow. But we're a shadow. We're We have a beginning point. We have a hopeful eternity with God, but we have a starting point. God has no starting point. He's not a shadow. Surely for nothing, he says, they, that's humanity, are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. So, Several years ago, we had a house full of kids, four children. Uh, I'm worth more dead than I am alive through life insurance. And we decided we better get a will. And we finished the will up, and the lawyer says to me, now you need to know that your wishes have been expressed and they've been signed in the presence of witnesses that you're in a rational mind, but you need to understand it's up to a judge as to what happens with what's left. Whoa. Now, the reason we do wills is so that the judge will know what your intention is and likely he's going to follow the intention. I said, well, why would he not? He said, because somebody could object to your will. So let me read it again. A man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. I'll just say it this way. When I die, I have no control. None. So the riches that we have bestowed and that we've gathered, somebody else is going to get them? Any authority that we had prior to the moment of death, at the moment of death, gone. Over. Any praises that we had received, whether we deserved them or they were offered in sincerity, a few moments after we're dead, forgotten. So, what president was the next president assassinated after Lincoln? Anybody remember? See, this happened every service. He was the 20th, Garfield. Let me give you a couple of facts. 
People think Garfield may have been the most intelligent president ever. He is the only seated person in the House of Representatives to be elected as president of the United States. Why do you not know anything about Garfield? He was the president for six months. Here's a fact. More people showed up for his funeral than they did for Lincoln's. That's how important he was the day he died. But because he was so brief, forgotten. Forgotten. So brothers and sisters, here's the truth. I've said this before. They're going to wheel me in this room. Some people may or may not say something nice. For a few weeks, you'll remember me. Gone. Life will move on. So, are you saying, preacher, just give up? No. So are you saying, preacher, let's just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die? How's that working for people? Producing a lot of happiness in our culture, isn't it? We're amusing ourselves to death is what we're doing. So what does David do? David asks the Lord for deliverance from sin and relief from discipline. So he's come to this understanding through God's discipline. He's brief. He's a vapor. He says, and now, O Lord, for what do I wait? What, for what do I hope? Now watch the turn. For what do I wait or hope? My hope is in you. It shifts from what to who. That is the core shift of discipline. When our our hope gets shifted to a what or to a wrong who, which God's never going to tolerate, and it gets shifted off of him, that our hope is to be in him. So David has returned here. My hope is in you. So he prays, deliver me from all my transgressions, from the power of sin. Do not take, make me the scorn of a fool. Relieve the consequences of my sin. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your, blo- of the, of your hand, or I am spent by the blows of your hand. Do you get the image here? Remove your stroke. I, I, I'm at the end of myself from the blows of your hand. Now, modern people get all flipped out here with this image. So is this saying literally God's giving me a whooping? It's hyperbole. Now I want you to see how God gives a whooping. Because some of you are getting one and you're not acknowledging you're in one. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. That's how he does it. When your heart has shifted away from the Lord to something else or to someone else, that's what he goes after. And like a moth, you don't even know it's happening. When a moth consumes your clothes, some of you know this, some of you don't. Times have kind of changed. I don't wear a suit very often. A couple years ago, I went to get a suit out to to wear for a wedding, and it had holes everywhere. A moth had eaten it. Worthless. Jesus said it this way. This is Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or thieves break in and steal. Then he says, here's the core issue. For where your treasure is, there will your what? Your heart be also every time. Whatever it is you treasure, that's where your heart's going to go. And what the Lord desires, what must be true because he's the eternal holy God, 
is that our hearts are to be directed toward him. And when we who are professors of Christ, followers of Jesus, who claim to be believers in the one true God, live and treasure something else, this holy God says, no. That will not be. And he will do whatever necessary to turn your heart back to him, to where you treasure him. So if that's where you are, if you realized or are realizing that's where I'm at, what do you do? What do you do when the discipline of the Lord gets your attention? Number one, you cry to the Lord in desperation. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. Tears and prayer sometimes are the same thing. Sometimes the tears are the prayer. When you have come to the utter end of yourself, anybody ever ask you just the right question and you just erupted? Start crying? Wouldn't even words, it was just the tears flow. Anything can be an idol, anything has been an idol. I was in my 20s, early 20s. Here's how, here's how it got erupted. I was driving in Hickory, which we have the weirdest streets where I'm from. They don't make any sense. And you're going to have to yield quite often. And I looked the wrong way and ran into the back of a car. Now, this was in the late 80s. And uh, I was driving a 76 Maverick, which was made out of steel, and I ran into a Ford Galaxy, which was made out of steel, and it didn't dent either one of them. It jarred us all hard. But after we pulled away, I pulled over the side of the road, and I erupted in tears. Now, I can't explain to you why God took that little bump up to the moment to bring me to where I needed to be, but he did. Because ministry had become my idol. Anything can be an idol. Anything. And, and God used that and other circumstances at that point in my life to crush me, to bring me to the point of desperation. To cry to him. Some of you men in the room, go ahead. Drill in. Go ahead. Just remember, this is what you are. He's God. You're not going to win. Yield to him. Cry to him. Number two, recognize the temporary nature of life on earth compared to the eternal weight of glory. For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Now let's just think about this for a second. David, what office does David hold? He's the what? The king said, I'm a sojourner. What? He's the ruler of the kingdom. He's, he's the one who has ownership of the kingdom. And he says, I'm a sojourner? I'm a guest? See, David gains a perspective here that this isn't mine. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I invite you to turn there with me. 2 Corinthians 4. This is a text that's going to drive your growth group discussion for the week. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, so we do not lose heart. God's intention and his discipline is not to make his people lose heart. Never, never, never. So we do not lose heart. We keep perspective. Though our outer self is wasting away, we realize we're vapors, we're breath. But while we're doing that, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. What is this affliction doing? It's causing us to trust and depend on the Lord. So we look not to things which are not are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, 
their breaths, but the things that are seen are eternal. They're forever, the things that we cannot see. So brothers and sisters, we, we've got to look to that which is eternal. We've got to fix our eyes on the things of God. Now, here's what amazes me as pastor here. If you're new here, I'm not talking to you, okay? You might learn something from what I'm going to say. But for those of you who are members of this church, a church that claims to trust in Christ and we believe his word and his word is essential, we get together every week to hear the word expounded. We gather in growth groups and then we interact with you personally and we ask you how often you're reading your Bible and we're getting more than not. I don't. I just want to ask you, how do you expect to keep your eyes on the eternal when you separate yourself from the eternal word of God? You can't. You, 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 you've got to turn your eyes to the things of God personally and collectively together. And when we do, God causes us to see this is transient. There are things that matter forever. Last thing. When you, the discipline of the Lord gains your attention, what do you need to do? Repent and pursue joy. Now notice I didn't say repent and give up or repent and keep beating yourself up. Repent and pursue joy. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. What in the world does that mean? David asked God to look away from him. What does he mean by that? You've got to put it in context, and you've got to understand what he's saying here. He's saying, God, I get it. Relent from the discipline. I want to smile again. I, I want joy to return. I understand I'm transient. I understand I'm a mere breath. I'm going to depart for, for the rest of my life, for the foreseeable future, Lord. Take your hand of discipline off. And restore to me joy. I want you to turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Picking up with verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So let's start at the end here. God's concern is that we not grow weary and faint-hearted. So what does that have to do in our dealing with it, what does that have to do with considering the endurance of Jesus? How does that help us? I'll give you two reasons right now. Number one, because I, the sinless Savior, suffered on our behalf. He suffered what he did not deserve. He endured the cross on our behalf. So the, the author of Hebrews is saying, why are you picking up sin? I'm asking myself the question at the same time. Why? Why are you grabbing a hold of it and trying to keep carrying it? Christ died for it. Sin doesn't define you anymore. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Okay, I understand what you mean by that, but that's not who you are. You're a child of God. You're adopted sons and daughters of God. Sin doesn't define you anymore. Christ defines you. We fix our eyes on Jesus, not our sin, not our struggles. We fix our eyes on Jesus. That's eternal. We don't get fixated on the here and now. We throw these things off, the things that entangle us. Second thing I want you to see. Where is Jesus according to this text? Where is he? 
Somebody said it. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That means he has accomplished what he came to do. It's finished. It's done. He has taken up the seat beside the Father where he makes intercession on our behalf. That's what the rest of Hebrews is teaching us. So here's what we do while we run, we cry. We cry to the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father, who makes intercession for us. And we run, we run, throwing off sin, pursuing Christ, looking to what only he can give us and supply to us. And when we do that, joy. Joy. Where is the Christian joy? And you might say, well, you could have done a better job with the music. You could have given a more encouraging sermon today. You know, let me tell you where the Christian joy is, what happened to it, is that we're so focused on the here and now, we don't have any joy. Joy's never going to come by some kind of happy, clappy experience we create with each other. Joy comes from Christ. When we look to what is eternal, brothers and sisters, when we look to him, when we gather together and we point each other to him. That when I'm struggling, you don't beat me down. You point me to him. That we encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, encouragement is not just a pat on the back. Sometimes it's a confrontation. The word has a double meaning. We need both, but we need to pursue forward. So you know, here's my prayer for you. For some of you, you need to repent, probably for many of us. This, this, these last few weeks have brought things to the surface we didn't even know was there. We need to repent. And we need to pursue joy. He's not penalizing us. He put the penalty on Christ. We repent and we look to Christ and we pursue joy. And here's my prayer, that you're going to smile again. It's my prayer for you, that you're going to smile again. Let's pray. Lord, my mind right now goes to the bedside of dear saints who are slipping from this life with a smile on their face. Those moments of teaching this man the brevity of life have had tremendous impact on me. Lord, we need a cloud of witnesses around us. I pray, oh God, that we would be a witness to one another of running the race with endurance, of pursuing Christ and looking to Him. For those, Lord, whom the moths have eaten what they put their hope in, may they turn from the sin of trusting in whatever that was and look to You today. Oh God, do your work in your people and bring joy among us. We plead and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.